So about 14 years ago, a professor of math at uh, Lynchburg University discovered a flaw in the Pentium chip. Deep in the code of the SRT algorithm to calculate intermediate quotients necessary for iterative fixing of floating point divisions. It took me so long to be able to say that, so you thought I knew what it meant. There was a flaw, an error that meant that there was a certain probability the results would be an error. The chance Intel calculated was something like one out of 360 billion. They estimated that if you ran a spreadsheet for 27,000 years, you might hit it once. A flaw, an error, a mistake at the core of the operating system of this chip. Now, of course, America was not going to stand by quietly <laughs> in the face of this flaw. No, America launched a revolution in response. Here they are, marching in the streets all across America. This is China. Um, OK, not actually. But there really was an extraordinary outrage at this flaw. And people rose up, and they demanded, fix the flaw, Intel, and Intel in the first year, had to spend close to one half a billion dollars answering the demand to fix the flaw, and millions turned their machines in to have the flaw fixed. Now here's the code for that little bit of the Pentium chip where the flaw actually, it turns out I left the code for the Pentium chip at home, so I had to make up some code here. So some made up code <laughs> at the core of the Pentium chip where the flaw was. And I want you to look at this code and see the deep connection between this code at the operating system of this central machine of the PC world and this code at the operating system of a central machine of democracy. And I want you to ask the question, what happens when there are flaws? errors, mistakes in that code. What happens when that code misfires? What do we do? How do we respond? Because if we're going to have a revolution to protect the spreadsheet, what do we do to defend democracy? Now, people look at this question and they say, well, you know, this is really different. You know, the issues in a spreadsheet, they're right or wrong. But government questions, they're not right or wrong. There are lots of hard, conflicting issues. And that's right. Not all questions, though, the government faces turn out to be hard questions. There are easy cases that government faces. There are 2 plus 2 equal 4 questions that government faces. And the question is, how does our operating system handle these questions? Now, for 10 years, I spent life, my life fighting one set of these 2 plus 2 equal 4 questions. That battle began around October 27, 1998, when Congress passed a statute named in honor of this man, a statute called the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. A statute which extended the term of existing and future copyrights by 20 years. The 11th time Congress had extended the term of existing copyrights in the last 40 years, just every time Mickey was about to enter into the public domain, the Mickey Mouse Protection Act was enacted. Now, I looked at this statute and then I looked at the document that I usually use when I teach this course called Constitutional Law, and I found in this document this text. Actually, I had the original version. It was like that. Um, <laughs> the text says, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing four limited times. And I thought, hmm, that's puzzling. How can Congress extend the term of an existing copyright when the Constitution says they can grant these copyrights only for limited times? And more puzzling, how could it promote progress to extend the term of a copyright for a work that already exists? 
So I looked at these two puzzling problems, and I did what every good liberal law professor does. I filed a lawsuit about the question. And we raced to the Supreme Court, there I am in the Supreme Court, arguing this question that the framers would never have allowed this type of law, arguing to a bunch of conservative justices who happened to be asleep that day, because this was a total bust. We lost seven to two in that case. Court upheld Congress's power to extend the term of copyrights as many times as big media buys the right to extend the term of existing copyrights. Now, in that defeat, though, there was an extraordinary unanimity about a fundamental policy question. Did this act of extending the term of existing copyrights advance the public good at all? We had a brief filed by 17 economists, including five Nobel Prize winners, including James Buchanan, Ronald Close, and Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman said he would sign the brief only if the word no-brainer existed in the brief someplace. <laughs> no-brainer, Milton Friedman said. Apparently there were no brains here when they passed that statute. But after a decade of this work, I had that kind of flash of genius insight. You know, the sort of thing that convinces me that I must be a bright person who deserves a professorship at Stanford. Kind of flash of genius. The flash was this. It's not just here that government screws up in fundamental ways. Here's some others, right? For example, nutrition. There's a consensus that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. 2003, the World Health Organization tried to help with this problem. They set a standard of 10% being the total amount of calories that you get from something called sugar. Well, the sugar industry, though they have this little sweet image here, they went ballistic. There they are, ballistic about this claim. They got the United States Senate to threaten to withdraw funding from the WHO if they didn't withdraw their recommendation that no more than 10% of our calories should come from sugar. Here's the letter from the Senate signed by Larry Craig demanding that they back down from this outrageous position and adopt what was the reasonable position, according to the sugar industry, that 25% of your calories come from sugar. Well, the WHO wouldn't back down, but our government did. In 2003, the Food Nutrition Board issued standards saying 25% of your calories should come from sugar. So here is a balanced diet, according to our government. You can start with some Fruit Loops or M&M in breakfast. With a glass of milk, you can then have a cheeseburger, pizza for dinner, actually three slices of pepperoni pizza, and cookies, sugar cookies. That's a balanced diet, according to our government. Here it was, another easy public policy question our government gets wrong. Or maybe most profound, global warming. Right, we've all come to recognize the extraordinary danger global warming presents, but there has long been a consensus about this danger. The consensus that we're doing it, as Al Gore describes it, the debate is over. There are five points in this consensus. Number one, global warming is real. Number two, we human beings are mainly responsible. Number three, the consequences are very bad. Number four, we need to fix it quickly. And number five, it's not too late. Now, they did a study to evaluate how well that consensus was actually adopted by people who know something about the matter. So they took a random sample of 1,000 articles in peer-reviewed journals between 1993 and 2003. And they discovered that 0%, exactly 0, questioned the basic assumptions. Then they did a comparable study of articles in popular media journals between 1988 and 2002, 600 articles. They found that 53% questioned the basic consensus. Now that result is a product of the junk science that's been funded by the oil industry to make people think that two and two might be five under some circumstances. Who knows? We can't really tell. Leading to the extraordinary delay that our government has allowed, maybe 10 years before we address perhaps the most important public policy question our generations will face. Again, an easy question. The government just gets wrong. Now, in all these easy cases which the government gets wrong, 
Not just esoteric questions about whether Mickey Mouse will be free, but core questions, the most important questions. Two plus two equal four questions. The government gets wrong. And so when that happens, what happens then? What about these mistakes, these errors, these flaws in the operating system of our government? What do we do about these? Now, the framers of our Constitution were obsessed with the idea of independence, by which I don't mean the independence of 1776. I mean the independence that was at the center of their attention in 1785, the moment when every sane thinker recognized America was a failure when they recognized that the extraordinary corruption that had spread through state governments that could not be checked by a federal government was destroying democracy. And they looked for independence in representatives. They looked to the lack of independence in representatives as the cause of this extraordinary corruption. They looked at the dependence of representatives. They were dependent upon interests other than the people or the public interest, as Jefferson described dependency. It begets subservience and venality, suffocates the germ of virtue, and prepares fit tools for the designs of ambition. They saw this is what government had become, and they sought non-dependent, independent representatives who could find the right answer for the right reason to questions government faced. And it was their common aim to build institutions, to build constitutions against that dependence. Now, it's not very PC to say, but let's say it. They failed. They failed. Many who went to government through the history of our government were drawn to government for the most venal of reasons. Corruption was at the center of government throughout the country for most of our history, much worse than anything we've ever seen. Daniel Webster, at the time when he served in Congress, at the time Congress was considering whether to establish or how to regulate the Bank of the United States, was paid by the Bank of the United States. Here's a letter he wrote to the bank. If it be wished that my relation to the bank be continued, it may be well to send me the usual retainers. Bribery was not even a crime in Congress until 1853. The 19th century was a cesspool of corruption, and not just among politicians. In many jurisdictions around the country, up to 25% of voters sold their vote. Simple transaction. Buy it, it was sold, and voting was in public, so you could check who did what. So there's no golden past here. Our past is awful in lots of different ways, and we're better today. We're much better today in all of these ways. We're, we have a Congress filled with people who come to Congress with a single idea for about 10 seconds. But that's the idea they come to Congress with. The idea is, I'm going to do good. I'm going to take my values. Whether you agree with them or not, but I take my values and I do good with them. But here's the paradox. Even though from the individual perspective, we're much better today than we've ever been in the past, this problem is much worse for the nation. And that's because government is more significant today than it has ever been in the history of our nation. It's more critical to core national problems like health care and global warming, but it's more pervasive. Its fingers are everywhere. And increasingly, businesses realize the government is a tool of competition. The return from good regulation turns out to be higher than the return from good competition. And so that there's an explosion, there it is, in the influence game. The number of lobbyists in Washington has doubled since 2000. The cost of them has doubled as well. As the former lobby, chief lobbyist for President Clinton put it, people in industry are willing to invest money because they see opportunities here. And the public 
sees them too. Public skepticism about Congress has never been higher, and the respect for Congress has never been lower. When I toyed for about 10 seconds with the idea of running for Congress in an open seat in my district, we did some polling that discovered 88% of voters in the California district I live in believe that money buys results. And nationally, 19%, only 19%, worse than President Bush, have a favorable view of our Congress. The People's House is not. Now, the thing I want you to recognize about these facts that you all recognize and know and think about all the time is that this is exactly the dependency that our framers were worried about. Indeed, it is much worse than the dependency they thought they'd have to worry about. This is not the dependency Madison worried about. Madison spoke often as Ronald Reagan actually spoke. Here's Reagan talking about democracy in 1965. As he quoted someone else, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government, Reagan said. It can only exist until the voters discover they can vote themselves largesse out of the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidate promising the most benefits from the treasury, with the result that democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy. Collapses. But the thing Madison and Reagan missed is the problem we face is not a problem of the masses rising up and stealing money from the rich. That's not been a problem for as long as we can remember. The problem we face is exactly the opposite way around. It is the powerful using their power to capture government. And so long as there is private funding of public elections, that capture will continue. <laughs> Crony capitalism. Crony capitalism is at the core of our Constitution today, a subtle form of corruption by good, well, you know, good people. <laughs> Deadly for democracy. Now, this conference is an extraordinary celebration. I don't think there's been a social movement that has grown as fast or as successfully in the la as this movement has grown in the last seven years. This is a movement growing to attack core substantive issues, the issues around media, that will have profound process consequences. But the question I want you to think about today is when we succeed here, meaning succeed with media, Will these problems go away, meaning the problems of dependence I've just been describing? Or maybe put differently, can we succeed here in the problems of media? Before these problems go away, the problems of dependence. Well, I took my Intel Pentium chip and I did the calculation, and it turns out the answer is no and no. Fixing media can't fix this dependency alone. Because a well-informed public still has a private life, meaning always there will be stuff happening below the radar. All the action falls below the radar, and it won't be caught by even the most well-informed public. And even worse, we can't fix this before we fix this, meaning we can't fix media before we fix the dependence, because of the way this dependence destroys the efforts that we pursue in fixing media. For example, think about spectrum regulation. Since about 2001, there was a pretty strong consensus among policymakers that we should be experimenting at least with much more unlicensed spectrum. That was because of an explosion 
in innovation, Wi-Fi and other such technologies, taking advantage of unlicensed free spectrum. And we should have more of that innovation. Yet, policy here has moved in exactly the opposite direction. Since 2001, we've had much more licensed spectrum, less unlicensed spectrum. And is this a surprise? And is it a surprise that this spectrum is deployed in a way to enable further concentration of the owners of spectrum who will then leverage that concentration if Tim Wu doesn't have his way to control how we deploy the internet? Or second, you all should know this statute. This is the Communications Act, 1934. It has six titles. Title II covers something called telecom. Title VI covers cable. Traditionally, telecom was regulated by common carrier principles. Cable was not regulated by common carrier principles. At the birth of the internet, not that he was responsible for it, but at the birth of the internet, Al Gore had an idea about how to reorganize this title. He wanted to take title to telecom and cable as it relates to the internet and put it under title seven and then deregulate title seven. So minimal regulations, require interconnect, but nothing much more than that. Gore's team took this to the Hill. The Hill's response was, hell no. How are we going to raise money from the telecoms if we deregulate them, their question was. Now, there's a simple word for this dynamic. We should use it more often. It is extortion. Extortion. And the question we should ask our friends on the right is, how much extortion enabling regulation is there out there? If you're worried about regulation, maybe you should begin to wonder why there is so much, and this dynamic might explain it. And how much less would there be if we had public funding of public elections? Now, my point in talking about this here is not to get you to give up the work of media reform. It's to ask you instead to recognize we need to learn how to walk and chew gum at the same time. Either reform will depend upon both succeeding. And we need a good way to figure out how to address and make understandable these ideas of corruption and dependency and betrayal. And we need to make them clear if we're going to fix both of them. Now, this was the idea that Joe Trippi and I were noodling about when we were trying to figure out how we could take this wonderfully generative rhetoric of change and change it into something that would really make it a change. And that's why we launched this thing called Change Congress, which is a bipartisan reform movement designed to leverage reform work of others. The many others who have been working in this field substantively for generations. Think of it as a kind of Google mashup of these different reform movements, taking a cluster of issues, money, representation issues, integrity, and using the extraordinary new tools or the GNU tools that could drive reform in this space. We have a window, eight years where we understand these tools better than they do. And we can deploy them in a way to make change happen before they figure out what's happening. <laughs> now, we launched this project modeled on another CC project I've worked on, Creative Commons, which asked people to voluntarily pledge, people with the power here to voluntarily pledge, a commitment to these basic ideas of reform, both citizens and candidates. And the core first pledges we've been talking about are number one, that you will not accept money from lobbyists or PACs. Number two, a fundamental reform of earmarks. Number three, supporting public financing of public elections. And four, supporting an increase in transparency in how Congress functions.
on the most exciting latest news in what will be a series of extraordinary news coming from this man, my friend, Barack Obama, was that <laughs> yesterday, in his first day as presumptive nominee, he ordered the Democratic National Committee to say they will accept no more money from lobbyists or PACs. But I come here to talk to you. <laughs> You've been fighting the most important issue for getting democracy to work again. I want you to help fight the other most important issue for getting democracy to work again. We need your talent and passion and commitment and idealism. And most importantly, we need your success here. We all need it here. So, you can go there and help us, join us, to change this Congress as you help all of us to change the media that will define that Congress. Now, let me just end with one more thought. The flaw at the core of the People's House is dependency. You all understand this problem of dependency. You know it's dynamic. Think of it in your life. There isn't one of you whose lives have not been touched in some dramatic and horrible way by the dependency of an alcoholic. I know my life has. And when you think of the dynamic of the dependency of an alcoholic, the alcoholic might be losing his family, his job, his liver, but we all know he will not solve any of those problems unless he solves his alcoholism first. So it's not that the alcoholism is the most important problem, it's just the first problem he needs to solve if he's to solve the rest. There is no end to the problems that we as a nation face extraordinarily significant problems from global warming to Iraq to the economy to media reform to education to broadband growth even to copyright but we will not address these problems sensibly until we solve this first problem our own alcoholism our own dependency a dependency on the way money has corrupted this government As Josh Silver reminded us, it's not a new problem. It's just a new moment. It's a moment of extraordinary hope when we can change many things, but change this as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.